So before beginning, we take a moment to recognize that here in Nevada, we stand on the land of the Washishu, Washoe, Numi, Northern Paiute, Anui, Western Shoshone, Nuwu, Southern Paiute. We take a moment to recognize and honor their stewardship that continues into today. And with this recognition, we state an intention to rightfully include their voice and respect them as the 27 sovereign tribal nations of Nevada. Jerry. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for, for joining us. I know there's a lot going on right now with all the campaigns and events going on. We've been to several of ourselves this weekend. Sue and I have been making the round. So um, we appreciate you taking time to join us. Um, as you know, it's Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and so that's what our program is going to focus on today. Um, we're fortunate to have some activists um, that we love. From um, we, we have uh, Amy from uh, from the Cupcake Girls. And sorry, I'm on my iPad. I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> it's not my usual spot. Um, and uh, some activists from Youth Against Sexual Violence uh, today joining us. And we're going to have a, a really great uh, conversation with these organizations and, and learn about the actions we can take. Um, first, we, we always like to introduce our board. Uh, so I'm Jerry Burton. I'm the co-executive director. Uh, I'm in charge of programs, and I'm the coalition coordinator. Uh, Sue Birch is our co-executive director for legislative and PAC coordinator. Eva, who you've met, Eva Love, is a director of membership and volunteer coordinator and helps me with the programs. Madalena Robertson is our director of technology and media. She's been the one making all of our graphics for our, for our website and for our endorsements. And um, she's my right, Sue's in my right hand. Uh, Sarah Evans, our director of fundraising. I know she's there. Michelle Maese is a director of outreach. Laura Campbell, Director of Actions. Uh, Samantha Glover is a Director of Youth Outreach. Trisha Methner is our Secretary. And Lenoreen Briley is our Treasurer. So we have a really great board. And um, thanks to all of them for their volunteer work with us. So um, we have some events coming up in May. Um, I'm really excited because one of my ERA sheroes is Kate Kelly um, on May 10th at 7 p.m. There's going to be a reading and signing with her. She's the author of Ordinary Equality. And she's also going to have a conversation with uh, Pat Spearman. She's making a tour around the country. And she's been uh, having a, an activist in each uh, town uh, have a conversation with, with her about the book itself and the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it'll be at the Writer's Block, uh, which is at 519 South 6th Street. And... Um, Kind of stay tuned. We may do a little something beforehand. Uh, she has time beforehand, maybe a little fundraiser um, nearby, uh, possibly in Container Park, someplace like that. So we'll let you know the plan. But um, I'm a huge Kate Kelly fan. If you don't follow her on Twitter, you should. And uh, I think it'll be a really fun event. And um, we'll be also talking about our state ERA that I'm, I'm involved with. Um, and, and therefore, Nevada now is, is going to be key with the state ERA ballot question. Um, so we'll be talking about that there as well. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And then our next program, um, we, we're gonna have it on May 15th at, at 4 p.m. Um, at this point, we're thinking maybe that's when we're gonna have our next PAC fundraiser. So stay tuned, put the date on your calendar and stay tuned for what we decide to do there. because We've got some great candidates that we're endorsing and we need to raise money to uh, to help them help all these progressive candidates win. So we hope you'll join us for that. So, and if your organization or your campaign, if you're, we, I know we have some candidates on, um, has events or web, uh, web, you know, web links, uh, websites, please uh, put them in the chat and um, we'll save the chat and let people know about those kind of events coming up too. So, um, so I wanted to start off, um, before we have our speakers, Nevada now is part of a, a really great coalition, the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence Economic Justice Workshop. And the workshop is focused on collaborative, 
can't even talk, collaboratively preventing violence to economic equity. And we got together and have focused on five priorities and written a letter to the governor to talk about what we want to, to work on. Um, it's access to safe and affordable housing, increasing workplace equity and, and supports, comprehensive medically accurate sex and health education, access to affordable and available mental health providers, and increased state revenue to raise public benefit levels and supports. Um, these priorities highlight the strong intersections of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, but also Child Abuse, Abuse Prevention Month and National Fair Housing Month, which we were recognizing in the coalition was happening all, the, all together. And really, these issues are so important. Um, they have an impact on economic justice and equality um, and in all of these different movements. Um, so as we celebrate these awareness months and begin to prep for the 82nd Nevada legislative session, the Economic Justice Workshop hopes to work with Governor Sislak to prioritize economic justice as a preventative tool for violence prevention. And Nevada consistently ranks as one of the worst in the country for high prevalence of domestic and sexual violence. So the time to center this prevention is, is overdue. So we're really proud to be working with some really great organizations on this coalition. And so um, I think first, since we have everybody here, um, I'm one of the organizations in this coalition is the Cake, Cupcake Girls. And today we have Amy Marie Merrill. She's the executive director. And when I was thinking about introducing her today, I was looking on the website and I love the title that's right on their mission page where it says respect, resources, and relationships. I thought that was really said a lot. So Amy, thanks for joining us. And we would, would like to hear what the Cupcake Girls are doing. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Marie Merrill. She, her, I'm the executive director of the Cupcake Girls. Jerry, it's such an honor to be introduced by you. I am such a fan of your work and, and everything that you do here at Nevada Now, but also everything that you've done historically. I'm really impressed by you and thankful for your work in the community. Um, my name again, Amy Marie Merrill, and my history and perspective comes from being a service provider working with sex workers in crisis for the last 16 years, as well as sex trafficking survivors. I've worked in various spaces as an advocate, a program creator. I've also worked within domestic violence safe houses. Um, and then, like Jerry said, currently I'm working as the executive director of the Cupcake Girls. And the Cupcake Girls is a fantastic organization. I've been with them 10 years now. I'm celebrating 10 years this year. Um, the Cupcake Girls is a fantastic organization. The reason that they are is because they're really doing a great job at, or we're really doing a great job at making sure that the community education pieces that are necessary when we're walking into the work of working with sex workers and sex trafficking survivors is happening alongside the advocacy work. So what the Cupcake Girls does is we work in the prevention and aftercare of sex trafficking. We sit down with folks, whether it's a consensual sex worker, so somebody who's choosing to do the work of sex work, or somebody who's being sex trafficked, somebody who's not choosing to do this work. And we sit down with, the, with them and we say, what do you want? What's, what's something that we can do for you? Well, what do you want? Um, and sometimes somebody will come back to us and they say, I need a new washing machine. Or they'll say, I want to get sober. Or I want to get my kids back. Or I really need help getting a retirement fund put together. You know, I'm in my 60s and I'm realizing that I need a retirement fund. And so then what we do is we go out into the community and we talk to dentists and doctors and family lawyers. And we talk to people about record expungements and, and getting free root canals. We'll sit down with professionals and we'll say, could we get your services at a discounted or pro bono rate? And then we turn around and give those services directly to our clients so that they're able to access the care that they deserve. And what happens during this is our clients then have access to self-determination and self-empowerment because we're not putting them on a specific program. We're not saying you need to do these things in order to receive services. You need to leave your pimp or, or leave sex work or anything like that. We're saying we recognize you as human. This is the non-judgmental space. What are things that you're needing in order to succeed as a human? And we trust that that person knows the best path for themselves. Because a lot of the time, let's be honest, we all get confused, right? There's a lot of um, saviorism mentality where we get confused and we think that we know what's best for somebody and we just don't. We do not know what's best for someone. My path is going to be completely different than Jerry's, right? And that's good. 
it's a good thing because we're able to accomplish such beautiful things apart from one another, but together because we're able to access self-determination and self-empowerment. So we do that work with our clients through um, a few different programs. We have an advocacy program. So like I said, we'll sit down with our client one-to-one -one and just say, what do you want? And then we also do that through an outreach program, doing a lot of community education like this, um, or we're going into schools or a lot of colleges will ask us to come in and, and do um, lessons for their students. We're also educating Metro fire departments, um, lots and lots of different folks, businesses. Uh, and then we're going in and we're providing outreach services to the clients that we're intending to serve. So providing things like um, Narcan, um, providing condoms for a safe sex use, and, and, and a multitude of other things. And um, the other piece of what we're doing is a mentorship program. So clients that aren't necessarily needing to achieve any goals at a specific time, um, but they're really just wanting that community. A lot of our clients will come to us and say uh, that they would have been able to leave their trafficker so much sooner had they had access to strong community. And so we work to build that through our mentorship program where they're meeting once a month with um, somebody within our mentorship program and just doing a check-in and saying, how are you doing? What's, what's going on in life? Um, and then we also have a support group that meets once a week where folks are able to come in and just talk about what's going on in their lives. Um, you know, things that they're needing to talk out that maybe a lot of people aren't understanding the nuances of sex work, right? So we have people that um, have been sex workers for quite some time and, and they're scared to talk about it because they're worried that they'll lose their job um, or they'll lose their kids. And so just a safe space where they can have these kind of conversations. And I, I was really impressed and, like I said, really thankful for the opportunity to meet with Jerry because even though we're working in different and we're operating in different spaces within Nevada, we both get what's going on here. Um, and and I, like Jerry was saying, uh, we just wrote a letter together alongside the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence um, as a part of our economic justice workshop that we're both in, the Economic Justice um, Coalition. And I thought it was really interesting because a lot of the things that we're doing within the Cupcake Girls, we're providing people access to housing, we're providing people access to mental health services, we're providing education on what safe sex is, what safe sex looks like. Um, we're, we're looking to help explain and, and communicate with employers about the fact that, you know, somebody, yes, they were a sex worker before, and they can still be an amazing elementary school teacher. These things do not, you know, interact with each other negatively, that this person can be a beautiful parent, right? Um, and then, of course, like, really talking about the way that revenue creates patterns of of unsafety within within our client population. So if you have somebody that's working three to four jobs, right, that automatically makes them vulnerable in our population to violence, to many amounts of violence. And so I was really honored to be alongside Jerry and we can go ahead and, um, or I can share the letter or Jerry can share the letter with all of you if you'd be interested in reading it. It's fantastic um, that we sent to Governor Sislak and I'm hoping that we can see a lot of change happening within our state because we are, we're number one for a lot of things that I wish we weren't. And I'm excited for us to, to change that together. But that's a little bit about us, a little bit about the Cupcake Girls. And if you have any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and put our website in the chat and my email as well. You can uh, reach out to me or you can reach out to us at uh, www.thecupcakegirls.org. But I'm gonna go ahead and put that link in the chat as well. Thank you. And, and I should include that, that letter in, in, in our next email or have a link to people to be able to get to it. I wasn't sure how much we were sharing it yet. So <laughs> I think it would, and, and it is important um, for people to know. And I think important for the governor to, to see the different organizations that are on that letter because it's, it's some of the, you know, really great organizations in our state. So thank you, Amy. And as we, as we're talking, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, and before we introduce some of the candidates and move to the PAC part, we'll, we'll have a little time for, for questions. That, uh, so Eve, I, I know you'll help me keep an eye on that. So, um, so we, I wanted to introduce our, our two young activists. We're always looking for young people who are doing wonderful things in our community. And we met with Naika, um, I think you were on our December program originally. 
And then Layla and Maika came on the, and talked to us about some of the things they're doing in the Youth Against Sexual Violence uh, Nevada chapter. So we wanted to have them on today to uh, help uh, everyone uh, learn what they're doing and help promote what they're doing. And we're, of course, excited to see young people um, <laughs> active in our, in our community. And we just love you. So um, thanks for joining us today. And I didn't know which of Naika you were going to go first and um, talk to us about what you're working on. Thanks for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Actually, Layla is going to go first. And see okay, she's great. The president of um, That's Yachty, right. And then I'll follow. Um, thank you, yeah. Jerry, and all of so you. So, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself and let him know you're, you're, that, I, that you're president and then what Naika's title is as well. Thank you so much, Layla. So my name is Layla Rashid. Um, I am the president of the Nevada chapter of Youth Against Sexual Violence, and Naika here is my lobbying director. Um, so Youth Against Sexual Violence is a national nonprofit organization that is essentially focused on educating and su providing support um, to victims of sexual assault and doing everything we possibly can to kind of prevent it through education and other means of fundraising and um, support groups. So um, what we have done here in Nevada, um, as Amy and Jerry have touched on, um, which is Nevada is a state that is, I believe, fifth highest um, in rates of rape and sexual assault. And it, although it has been very slightly on the decrease in the past years, it is still an extremely prevalent issue. Um, and so what uh, Yasef seeks to do is kind of go to the root of the source. And that's why we are a youth-led organization that mainly targets students in schools. Um, so that's what we've primarily been working on and um, working with, um, is trying to get administrators to do workshops. Um, for example, we've worked with One Love, which is a non another nonprofit that kind of focuses on healthy relationships and kind of teaching in a more you know, easy, simplistic manner, um, teaching young people what a healthy relationship looks like and what consent in relationship looks like. Um, consent, what I have found um, in a lot of research and time in school is something that's not really heavily touched on in our education system. And that can be a real root of the issue when we talk about sexual assault. If people don't know boundaries, they don't know how to um, interact with others. And so I, for us, that's what had been a real big issue. Um, and so that's what we've done in terms of education. So again, as I said, we've held workshops. Um, we do little infographics that we post on our social media and we try to get teachers and alike in other schools to share it and interact with it. Um, in addition, we also uh, interact with our community in different ways um, in means of providing support to survivors. In our schools, we have tried to do creative events that to kind of interact and mobilize students, um, like a chalk festival where we will get um, a bunch of chalk, just a really simple event, a bunch of chalk and then seek out students to come and just write the notes of you know support little doodles saying we're here for you um, at schools that have been affected by sexual assault and violence um, just to help students and those victims feel welcome that we will we hear them with their stories and we are there um, to support them uh, throughout what they're going through so that's been a really big um, focus for us. Um, in addition to kind of broader community outreach, um, we have started, I believe we're on our second year of doing a, a clothing drive for women's shelters. And so we will go into schools and set up a box that we all donate completely um, to women's shelters like Safe Nest and um, all these other places to help other victims of sexual uh, assault. And so when Naika does, um, is more specific, it is interacting with lobbying um, and state legislation to kind of further aid and progress our fight against sexual violence. And so um, I'll open up the floor for her to talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, like Leila said, I'm Naika Belize. I am Yasa's head lobbying director. Uh, basically, um, because I have such an interest in law, outside of YASIV. I love interacting with law, changing law, creating law, um, and anything because I want to be a future attorney. When I first joined YASIV, I knew that although I loved the aspect of us doing education, going into different schools and educating different students about aspects of sexual assault as well as healthy relationships and things like that, I knew that one of the greatest ways to make changes and to protect sexual assault survivors is by putting concrete, definite, legal um, protections so that uh, they can be helped and for the long term. 
so that even if they have a workshop and some, something might happen to them, they can go and say, this law protects me. I'm a protected person and feel that they are a true citizen in this state. So basically, um, I've used whatever knowledge I have and also the help and advice of other people who are greatly more knowledgeable than I am because I don't really have that much a law degree or anything like that. Um, I use that all that information as well as the other members of the lobbying group that I um, lead to create, draft, or advise different bills to be created in Nevada. Um, my first year being in Yasif was last year. Um, during that time, I basically well, I, as well as the group that I was in, I was with that time, because I was not yet the head lobbying director, we led an initiative where I um, basically spoke to Senator or Nevada State Senator Melanie Scheibel. I'm sure that a lot of you probably know her, and we talked about the loophole in Nevada, where basically um, police officers or state police officers were able to sexually assault people in their custody and get away with it because they would say, um, one, it would be seen as rape because everyone knows with that such po power dynamic between a, a police officer and someone in custody, they can easily say something like, um, if you engage in sexual activity with me, then I'll give you a short sentence. And then something bad that would be considered rape. But because a police officer holds so much power, they can say, no, they consented to it. And then no one would think about, oh, that person was raped. So unfortunately, because of that loophole, a lot of people have become victims of sexual assault and have not gotten the justice that they deserve. So after finding out that that was such an issue and that Nevada was one of those a lot states that allowed for that issue to happen, um, I, of course, immediately emailed all the senators or state representatives that I knew of, and I told them, hey, um, I'm part of YASIV. We have a lobbying or a group, and we would love in any way to help create a draft uh, create or draft a bill that would eradicate this issue. Because as a lot of people might not be aware of, but having a ton of youth voices behind something can really empower a bill to be pushed through and create a change. So after that time, we talked to Melanie Scheibel. We figured out that her she already had a team of people working on this problem. But with our help, we were able to even push further. I was even able to surprisingly show her that was that there was a small part of the bill that she was creating that still included a loophole in which police officers were able to sexually assault people that they were currently arresting but not had put already in custody. So if you weren't weren't already in custody, but you know they pulled you over and they sexually assaulted you, they could still use that. Oh, they consented and then get away with it. So I pointed that out to her and she, although she hadn't seen it before, she welcomed that idea, put that into pursuit and also included that into the bill. So now that bill is, I think, was already passed and Ms. Uh, Scheibel was able to, you know, completely eradicate that loophole in Nevada. So that was one of the first things that I was able to do with Yasif and something that I'm very, very proud of. Um, after that year, I took um, lead as the head lobbying officer and I'm now directing the group. And we are working on basically creating a definition of consent in Nevada statutes because Nevada does not have one, which is very integral in saying what rape is because if people don't understand what consent is and if consent isn't legally defined then someone can get away with sexually assaulting someone by just changing that idea in court and then so if we have, if we have a concrete legal definition we have something to um, have foundation of in those cases and then i also want to work on changing the legal definition of rape in nevada because it was definitely outdated. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but a few years back, the um, Congress or the Supreme Court had already passed a new definition of rape, and that was a more outdated version. It um, was more inclusive, included, um, because in the definition currently, it states that rape is just when you penetrate someone, and that's it. Um, that's what Nevada says, but the new uh, updated definition is for when it could be through um, oral the sex or just penetration or um, outside thing. It's a very more broad definition that would include uh, more things to allow people to be seen as sexual assault victims when they are and also be able to give them more justice. So I want to update that definition in Nevada to be more inclusive and have give more people the chance of being heard and be given justice. So yeah, that is what I do in Yasif. That is the lobbying side of our organization and something that I'm very, very proud of with um, the people that I work with. You know, Naika, I just have to say, I am like, I'm like fighting back tears. That was, that gave me a lot of hope, honestly. 
um, you know, the, the pieces that you were touching on, they're not conversations that are happening often, and they're necessary conversations. Um, the amount of rape that's going on between uh, our clients, um, our clients being raped by police, it, it's been just mind-blowing to hear the history there. Um, and thank you so much for not only speaking up about it, but deciding that you wanted to change it. Um, thank you. It, it, it really means a lot, a lot to us, a lot to our clients. Um, and then the pieces that you were speaking on about updating the verbiage surrounding consent, absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, we were talking a lot about like the difference within our org, the difference between sex work and sex trafficking being consent or coercion. And because those definitions are not clear within our laws, sex trafficking survivors within our state are still being arrested by police. They're still being arrested, they're still being booked, and then I'm having sex trafficking survivors come to us at the Cupcake Girls and saying that their arrest was more traumatic than their sex trafficking experience because they are waiting and waiting and waiting for the police to come. And when they finally came, they were arrested and they were booked and they were charged. Um, and so, Naika, honestly, like I just listening to you, I'm overwhelmed at how amazing you are. And I think the world's better because you're here, truly. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. That truly means a lot. The work I do is definitely in order to help people and help sexual assault survivors because I, for one, have unfortunately been a victim of sexual assault. So I know what it's like to be put in a place where you don't feel like there's any justice that, um, given to you or where you cannot find justice. So I knew that with that motivating me, plus all the stories and testimonials that I've heard from other people, I definitely always want to push for that type of change. Well, and, and thank you. And we are so inspired by you and, and Layla to have young people who see these issues and, and have experienced, unfortunately, yourself and actually want to make change. And, you know, there are people that that never do, never do that. And um, we're so inspired by by the we were inspired from you back in December and um, the work that you're doing. And I'm excited to hear about the bills you're working on as I think you and I talked about, we have Samantha Glover on our board who was able to pass a bill and um, people like you and, and Samantha and Layla show young people that you can get involved, you can make a difference. And at, you know, in high school age, it, it's, it's really inspiring to those of us who've been activists for a while. And um, we know you're our future, that's for sure. And Eva, do you see some questions that we should cover before we so we can have a little more conversation. I yeah. want to okay, that we have um, that we will have a recording. Yes. And um, I think everything else has been um, answered or they're just comments about what an amazing, how amazing these two, two young women, three young women, <laughs> Amy also are and how how impressed we are with them. So um, I, I think oh, there's, there's, no, I was just, there is one question. What oh, is something okay. we can do to be advocates and help? I was just about to touch on that. I was going to say before okay. we move on, Layla has um, things to share with you all about how to get in contact with the ASIV, how to help us, how to um, support us, and things that you could do to also be a supporter for people who have um, been victims of sexual assault. So, Layla. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, as we said, a lot of what we work with is, you know, schools and administration to try to allow us to work with students and educate them more on, you know, consent and consent versus coercion, as Amy said, that was a big thing for us, um, especially in terms of like rape culture and try to dismantle that locker room talk, you know, that locker room talk can be the star and the catalyst of so many, you know, different assaults and offenses later on in a person's life. Um, and so a big thing that we actually need support with is, you know, going to those administrations and getting the respect we deserve um, in terms of being taken seriously. Because a lot of, you know, you go to the dean of a school or vice principal and you say, hey, I don't like the way you're defining consent in your classroom. I don't think you were touching up enough on consent and healthy relationships in these health classes with these, you know, vulnerable 14 year old students. Um, they need to have great education and they'll just brush you off and say, no, I don't want that in our school. Um, I believe once you received um, from some uh, high school admin, admin um, had said, only nurses are, you know, qualified to speak about sexual assaults and all that. And I was blown away. I was like, 
what? Like, and you know, as we've seen in these past couple of years, sexual assault in schools is such a prevalent issue, not only among students, student against student, but even recently we've seen, I believe at El Dorado High School, students against staff and against teachers. It is something that not only affects, you know, your children and, you know, all their friends, but even teachers and coworkers. And so that's a big issue we need to touch on. And so what you guys can do, um, if you do choose so, is to help us, you know, gain that reputation of being taken seriously. Um, I believe we plan on holding a couple more like petitions to try to get into more schools. Um, I believe we're only in like two or three in Clark County, but to get into more schools and to kind of support us um, to spread um, a lot of what we can do. Exactly. Absolutely, Sandra. Uh, a lot of what we can do in our community can start on a school level. For example, the clothing drives that we can do um, just at ATEC alone, which is the school that Nate and I go to, Advanced Technologies Academy. Um, I believe we donated around, uh, I forgot, like 20 pounds of clothes just last year during COVID um, to SafeNest. And so if we do that at 10 or 20 high schools around the city, imagine all the materials and resources that these um, women who are struggling in their, in that point in their life can have. Um, they can, having shoes on your feet can be, means so much to a person who has, you know, nothing left. It may, they may feel like they have nothing left. Um, so to get to, into schools, uh, we need approval from some administration. So from like a, a vice principal or a dean or something like that. Um, at ATEC, uh, thankfully, we have a very um, supportive administration, so we've been able to hold um, uh, workshops and events, and, you know, our staff has supported us, but not every school is like that. Yeah, and I included a link up in the chat. I can send it again to our national website and our link tree that has, you know, forms if you know any young people who would like to get involved. Um, currently, we are seeking a vice uh, president a position for the next year and currently, um, as well as, you know, more research and more lobbying uh, to help make it out in our mission. Um, in addition to that, we have a bunch of petitions, not only for, you know, solely Nevada issues, but also something we noticed or picked up on is like more national things, like a lot of sexual assaults in ICE uh, detention camps. That was a big issue that we noted on. Um, if you would like to visit our Instagram, you will see a whole lot of, you know, different infographics and resources there. So yeah, those are a couple ways we can do it. I'm not sure, Naika, if you have any more. Um, I was just going to say um, another way, like Layla said, go to our Instagram, that she linked below. Um, spread the word. If we have a new post, you know, us share it to your Instagram. Talk about Yasa to people that you know. We definitely, definitely need new members. Um, one of the things that yeah, um, Layla shared was our link tree, which has the applications for not only a vice president, but also new members who want to apply to Yasa. And um, during the pandemic, a lot of students had to quit Yassif because of, you know, they were dealing with problems and issues in their family and they could not be as active. But now that Yassif is back up and COVID is not such a prevalent issue as it was before, we definitely, definitely need new members again, especially for things like I want to achieve, which is basically with lobbying and other projects that I'm um, thinking of doing with Yassif. I need other members to do it with me. Can't just do it alone. So if you guys know other youth that would be interested in it, or as you said, I think someone talked about their daughter at Rancho, share it with your kids, share it with their, your kids' friends, share it with your friends who have kids, share it with everybody that you want um, so that Yassif can grow and be have a bigger impact in Nevada. I know that someone had a question, which was, do we believe that the greatest impact will be achieved at the school level? which is talking to administration or changing district policy. And I think it's both. I think that the change cannot be with only one place because hypothetically, let's say that we achieve change in the school uh, level. We implement um, comprehensive sexual assault and sexual violence or just healthy relationship education in the school and students are doing what they, they know what they need to do. They learn about consent and violence and everything. But then even with all that knowledge, someone still gets sexually assaulted then that student goes to the district or to criminal justice system or whatever, and they try to get justice. But that new policy work was not implemented for them to be able to get that justice because things such as consent being implemented into the Nevada statutes or new definitions of rape or just new things for survivors to be um, have be protected against in 
the law wasn't implemented yet, then all that work we did in schools doesn't really do much for that victim because they still aren't given the justice they, that they need. So we need both the, the change on the school level plus the change of, for changing district policy to work in cohesion so that even if you are just someone who supports sexual assault victims or if you are a sexual assault victim, you have the knowledge that you need and you gain the justice that you deserve in all instances and situations. Yeah, um, absolutely. I completely agree with Naika. Um, I think as important as, you know, making actual legal change and distinction in this issue, uh, to make a, an actual solid impact in, you know, our society and how people view sexual assault, we need to change the culture. Um, and I think that's where, you know, going into schools and trying to permeate into the education and the way students see it, that is really going to, you know, make a huge impact on the culture and for the generations to come. Because, you know, at a young age, it's, you know, the starting, that's how you start to see the world is in high school and middle school, you know, the where we have our most of our activists. Um, and so if we can permeate that, then the law that we may implement can actually become more effective. You know, a lot of things, if they're not so seen as socially, um, you know, negative, I suppose, like if they're still going to continue being crimes, we've seen that with drug use, if it's still popular among the population, even if it's illegal, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stop. So if we really dig at the culture and try to eradicate this notion that, you know, it's so women, oh, she was asking for it, that kind of thought process, we can make our laws more effective and completely, you know, redo what we, what we see as sexual assault and try to eradicate the issue truly. Have you guys ever, oh, sorry, you can go ahead. I was going to say, if you ever, if you guys ever have any more questions, we may answer or find any ways to, you know, find other people that you want to send over to me or anything like that. Um, that is, I just put my email in the chat. Uh, Layla could also put her email in the chat. That is the best way to reach out to me, if not my Instagram, um, because I'm always checking my emails. So that is how you can reach out to me. And we are always checking it. We are always want to, if anything has to do with Yasiv or any other things that I'm passionate about, I will definitely reach out to y'all and do whatever I can. Um, so yeah, what were you saying, Ms. Merrill? Don't worry. <laughs> okay, so I think I love what you both are saying, and I just want to kind of like push one point too. Within the state of Nevada, we are seeing a rise of student-on-student -student violence, and, and that is true, but that is in direct correlation to the rise that we're seeing and lack of funding for our education and the lack of sexual education in schools. So we need high quality, age appropriate and evidence-based comprehensive sexual education because without an understanding of what sexual, sexual violence is, individuals can't name the act or recognize when they as victims um, are, and then and when they are victims or when they are victimizing someone, right? And so they're less likely to seek out support, have intervention or have justice. So we're seeing that we're having this rise of violence in our state, right? Um, where kids are experiencing so much violence in their homes. That is what they're being taught, what they're, they're being taught in their homes and their friends' homes. And so it's become so normalized. They're going into school and they're just acting out what they're learning. They're kids. They're kids, right? And so, so because they're not receiving that education within the home, it's up to us as, as a state, as a community, to decide to build stronger communities, to decide to build educated, educated communities by placing, like I said, the, the evidence-based comprehensive sexual education um, in our schools. And, and we're not doing that. And we decided not to do that again and again. And it's causing deaths. It's causing deaths. People are dying. And so we have to decide that enough is enough and put that in the schools. And I'd also like to say um, that, oh, I'm sorry, I was going no, to say no, that. No, no, good, go. I was going to say that um, as your daughter who has heard the preschool principal say that there's a rise in sexual violence, which is student against student, um, it's always a good idea to ask that principal, well, what are you doing about it to make sure that there's a change and to make sure that that change isn't punitive to just rather hurt students, but also includes a, a way for them to be educated and healed. Because I know that a lot of administration, when a problem arises, they'll say, that was bad, and it's happening because if students are acting bad, and the way that we're going to work on it is by giving everyone detention and suspensions. And that's a conversation. It's over with. They don't talk about it anymore. But instead of doing that, maybe um, just have 
I wouldn't force your daughter to do it. It's not her job to, you know, be the voice for everybody, but ask your daughter, maybe she could ask the principal, hey, what are you doing about it to ensure that students are learning about this rise in sexual violence and what they can do to prevent it or uh, what education they might see later on in their health classes that would stop this from happening. And if he says, or um, whatever, if your principal says, well, we are instructing more suspensions, ask him, well, what about education? And if he doesn't have an or if they don't have an answer, then maybe give an idea like, hey, I'd like to see myself in my health classes a more restorative, a more um, comprehensive sexual sexual health curriculum. That would probably help. Or if he or if they're just, you know, not they don't really want to push into it. Contact me. Send my email to them. I'll definitely try to have a conversation with your principal. I'm always ready to speak to adults who aren't ready to enact change and see what they're, where they're going. So yeah, it's always about starting conversations, asking questions, and making sure that people know that there is a different way to deal with problems rather than enacting suspensions and detentions and punitive uh, structures. Because the, the Nike is exactly on point, and, and then I'm going to shut up, but, but <laughs> everything that um, Layla and Nike are saying is, it's true. It's fact-based. This is data-based evidence that they're talking about here. So so when we're when we're talking about continuing the perpetual violence that we as government structure, we as a community are putting onto our children, we're just going to see this problem get worse and worse and worse, right? Like I just got a letter from CCSD that said that um, bullying is not going to be tolerated. We're going to be arresting kids that are bullying in our schools. But there was not one thing in this letter that talked about we're going to be enacting education on what strong relationships look like, on what community care looks like, on what resources people can reach out to if they're having trouble in their homes and they're being bullied themselves, right? These are children and they need to be taught good, healthy information. And we're not doing that. And then we're punishing them and perpetuating violence in our own state. So Naika, Layla, I'm like literally sweating. I'm so happy right now. <laughs> you two are amazing. And, and what an amazing conversation. I wanted, when I was going to ask a question, and I think Venetia kind of covered a little bit in the chat, um, you know, what can be done? We, we know, you know, we're talking about legislation, we're talking about um, getting education into schools, and Venetia has to improve sex ed in schools. We need everyone to vote in the upcoming election to, for pro-choice, pro-quality candidates to ensure there's a majority of humane people on all boards and in elected office. And, I think that's true about the school board, you know, on up that we've got to have people who who agree with that statement. And um, what and and one of the things that that kind of falls in line too is there's just instead of putting you know more police and and, and kicking more kids out of school, there's no mental health help at all. And as Sandra Cosgrove has been talking about, we don't have enough people even trained, even if we had you know tons of money. But um, there's just no mental health at all. So, um, and I see Audrey has her hand up. So first I wanna say our future is guaranteed with young people like you. I'm so blown away by that. Um, but I wanna share with you, trying to get programs in the school system is almost virtually impossible. I had um, like, maybe six years ago or whatever, uh, an anti-bullying program that was created by, by um, the International Committee of Artists for Peace and Herbie Hancock is the president. I mean, we're talking solid people here. And it was a musical, you know, that, that taught people about this. And I got it down to, uh, I had approval from two different superintendents and they kept pushing me down to, to the people who were in charge of, of um, uh, what do you call it, uh, whatever it is. Anyway, it's not bullying, but it, the, the diversity is something or other. You know, and, and I had this one woman that's like, we're going to do this. She had me come talk to 200 teachers, and they're all like, when can we get this program? And nothing ever happened. Uh, and so I have to tell you, because you're in the schools, you may have a much better chance of being able to enact some of those programs. And, and, and I think you've got to be ballsy, too, when you get the laws changed. You need to go to the police department and tell them you need to do a program there, too. 
Okay. Well, and, and I was going to say we've got some great elected people on the call today too that that might work with you on some of these bills you'd like to do, Naika. So we'll have to make sure yep. that you uh, get their contact information and and they get yours. Yep. <laughs> so I love who, that. Who we elect makes a difference. Yes. If y'all again, Absolutely. my email is in the chat. Um, y'all can drop your emails. I'd love to interact with you guys. There's a lot of changes that we can do. Um, I know that. It is very, very hard to enact programs to schools, but if you guys have heard of the Sex Education Advisory Committee that is already in place in Nevada, that is some place that we can start um, because as much as I try to see and be optimistic about how our um, government works in Nevada, the Sex Education Advisory Committee has not done its best to ensure that we have comprehensive sexual education in schools. And while we hope that they'll move towards that in the future, they've shown that they don't really have much of a motivation to enact comprehensive sexual education because that education advisory committee is basically um, in charge of our sexual education for CCSD. They're the ones who put in the curriculum, the ones who make the textbooks, things like that. Uh, we, we have reached out to them as a organization before and tried to, you know, talk to them and say, hey, we are an entire organization made up of youth in CCSD that want to tell you what we'd like to see in our own curriculum, which, you know, would sound amazing. Like, hey, the youth want to tell us what they want to learn. And they never responded back. They ignored us. We tried again and again, even tried to um, be put into the committees, and they just rejected us, ignored us, and things like that. So uh, if you guys do want to find a way to um, fix some things that are directly talking about sexual education, this is something that I'm going to be trying to do in the future for Yasif. Right now I'm solely focusing on you know, the consent and rape statutes being revised. But in the next years, I do want to try to find a way to enact a bill or something to basically reform the advisory committee. Because if we're going to have an entire group of people that are dedicated to giving us a sex education, then I hope it's comprehensive and that it actually works for the youth. So yeah, if you guys have any way to you know contact them, make it better, you have any people who know how to do that, how to get in there and try to find a way to reform, get on them, talk to them, or send them to me. I love to read them. <laughs> well, Maika, we just had Venetia post to put in the chat when the next meeting is. So it sounds like something we ought to uh, find a way to to attend and, and get to know who's on that committee. So um, make make them do their their job. <laughs> so it's been a wonderful conversation. We just want to have some time to to talk about uh, some of what our PAC is doing. Uh, speaking of electing good people. Um, Sue's going to talk about what the Nevada Now PAC is doing and um, introduce a couple people that we're wanting to get to know. Sue? How do I follow all that? I know. Um, <laughs> we could talk for a while. <laughs> we, could, so. we, could, we could talk for a while, but I do want to point out that, yes, uh, we do have some amazing uh, assembly members here on this Zoom right now um, before we talk about the rest of the stuff. We have Assemblywoman Claire Thomas, Assemblywoman Venetia Considine, and Assemblywoman Shonda, Chandra Summers Armstrong. I'll get it right eventually. Um, not only are they absolutely amazing women, they are all also endorsed by uh, the Nevada Now PAC. So very pleased to uh, have them on here. And Naika and Layla, I, I, were, I was watching them as you all were speaking, and um, I, I know they have been taking notes, and uh, uh, they've made comments in the chat. And uh, so, yeah, and again, I agree with Audrey, the future is, the future is great with, uh, with these young women. So um, what more can I say on that? Um, back, to the, back to PAC business. I want to thank everyone for being at our event last month. I know I put out on social media a whole bunch of thank yous, um, but it was absolutely amazing. Uh, I, think we, I think we maxed out at uh, like 120 people in attendance, half of them being candidates. We raised well over $4,000. Um, we've already put out there a, a couple of thousand dollars to endorse candidates. So as Jerry said, we're going to be trying to figure out another uh, um, fundraising event for uh, May to try to uh, um, kick off uh, early voting. 
Um, Cause as Venetia said, get, we got to vote. We got to get these, uh, these equality equity candidates in the office from top to, to bottom. So um, be on the lookout for that. Um, on the other hand, I have the honor of having two fabulous women that are running for city councils, uh, one in Las Vegas and one in Henderson. And something neither one of them know right now is that this week they will be endorsed by the Nevada Now PAC. So I want to say uh, welcome to Nancy Brune, who's uh, running for Las Vegas City Council in Ward 6, and Jody Tyson, who is running for Henderson City Council Ward 3. And I'm going to have them do, um, do a very quick intro to themselves and uh, a little bit of background, and then we'll have a, a couple of questions for them. So, uh, Nancy, you want to take it away? Thank you, Sue, um, and thank you for that news. I'm tearing up a little bit, so I, that means a lot. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to both Sue and Jerry for having me on the program today. And more importantly, thank you to you all for highlighting city council races. This is my first rodeo, and I'm finding that you know city councils are way at the bottom, maybe one step up from school boards. So I really appreciate you highlighting city council races. A little bit about me is for the last 10 years, I've been running the Gwynn Center, which is the state's only bipartisan policy center. Prior to that, I worked for four years at Sandia National Labs, where I worked on issues of water security, the impacts of climate change, and homeland security. I've been um, privileged to be able to serve on a number of national and state commissions and several local nonprofit boards, so very active in the community. Um, to the question of why I'm running, I think Jerry asked me to speak to that. I think like everyone here on the phone, I love Las Vegas. Las Vegas is an amazing place. We have a unique history. We have tremendous cultural diversity. We have incredible landscapes, tremendous wealth, um, innovation, and yet as I look around, I truly believe our city has lost its way. We have a housing crisis that's affecting everyone. We literally have seniors and veterans who serve this country having to choose between paying the rent or paying for prescription medicines. Violent crime is on the rise. We keep hearing that from a lot of polling that people are really worried about security, um, which includes our kids in our schools, which we're all talking about. We've talked about that a lot today. And we now have gangs up in Ward 6, which is the seat that I'm running for. Um, and I think most of us in the community also realize that, you know, our school district, we've lost confidence in our school district. So we have some really big problems. And against the backdrop of these really complicated challenges, I think the government, which is supposed to be by and for the people, has, has, is letting us down. It's, it's, it's failed its residents. Um, we have one set of of elected officials who spend more time fighting on social media and playing to really extreme partisan allegiances. And then we have another set of elected officials who are so concerned about their next position that they avoid taking on these really big, messy problems. And as a result, I think people are losing confidence in government. We see a record number of folks moving to away from either party and becoming independent voters because everyone's tired and frustrated. And so I'm running because I think we can do better. We need to do better for our kids, for our grandkids, for our neighbors, for our workers. And again, because we have so many resources, I think we can do better. Um, so that is why I'm running. President Obama said when he was in office, you know, the change that we want to see will not happen if we wait for someone else or some other time. And so I am stepping out of my comfort zone as a policy researcher behind the scenes to run for office, something I never thought I would do. Um, and I'm hoping to lean into my experience, uh, both as a policy analyst, like I think I'm well equipped to take on some of these really big, messy problems, but also my experience truly working with Democrats and Republicans and Libertarians. I think a lot of candidates talk about working across party lines but I've actually spent the last 10 years doing it. So I hope to lead the same way I've been running the Gwynn Center and looking at data, bringing common sense solutions to the policy debates and working with everyone. So I look forward to meeting 
all of you or those that I haven't met, just a few. Um, but also, if you'd like to learn more about my campaign, please visit my website. And thank you again. It's a real honor. And thank you, Nancy. And please, Nancy and Jody, put your uh, campaign information in the chat when you when you get a chance. All right, um, Jody. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming on. And I am so glad I got to participate during April in this meeting for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, and I'll just skip to the part first where uh, the question was, you know, why do you want to run for office? And I will say it has been my life goal to help improve community health. And if elected, I would be the only person on the city council in Henderson who has experience in public health and community services. And I started in that journey of community services um, in this space that Naika and Amy and, um, and Layla are in. And I just want to encourage you and all the work that you're doing and being the kind of advocates and champions that we need in our state and that we need across the country. Um, I was very honored to help bring some of the first Violence Against Women Act money um, for coalition building um, to our state in 1998, when the Violence Against Women Act was actually reauthorized the first time in, um, in 98. And in that space of time, we had a domestic violence coalition, but we did not have a sexual violence coalition. And so um, the state asked me if I would help come in and organize a, a multidisciplinary coalition against sexual violence. And it was um, such an incredible opportunity to get my feet into an issue that was near and dear to my heart as a sexual assault survivor too. Um, so uh, sexually assaulted at the age of 16, I was living in Boulder City, but I actually was sexually assaulted in Henderson. And so it's, um, it comes full circle then when you come back to a community and you want to represent them as their city council person. And when people say, well, what can somebody who's a city council person do to help improve health in a way that really affects women and children and uh, people who are survivors of sexual violence. Well, I can tell you for sure that a city council person has a great opportunity to do that because we do have pass-through funds that come from the federal government right into our city, and we think about how do we help it build health and opportunity for people in our community. So there's um, funds that we actually get to give to agencies in our community, including our domestic violence shelter that's here. Um, but also, we have the opportunity to bring more health services to our community. When women and children and others have many, many um, opportunities to talk to trusted adults about things that are going on in their lives, um, they're more likely to talk to somebody about what's happening to them. So, um, so I am very grateful and honored for the opportunity to run for this office and very humbled um, by NOW's endorsement. So thank you very much. And I will put my information in the chat. But one thing that I know that Nancy and I are both very excited about and just really in need of are volunteers. Uh, volunteers for canvassing and volunteers for doing things like this. Um, today we had a postcard party where um, people came and uh, wrote out postcards about why they think that Nancy or I would be good people to um, to run for the seat or to actually be a city council person. And that those postcards actually go to people who we aren't able to visit with personally, like people who live in gated communities or apartments. And so um, if you'd be willing to take a pack of 28 postcards, um, I am going to put that information in the link to my website right in the chat so that you can contact us and, and be part of such incredible city council campaigns. And hello to all my um, Emerge sisters that are on this call today, too. I support you and I'm looking forward to continuing to work with all of you. Thank you. Uh, every, everyone knows uh, postcards are my specialty. I do not like phone banks. I do not like canvassing, but postcards is easy peasy that and post-it notes um so i was gonna say we are definitely in on the postcards jody and that sounds like something fun we can get involved with i before you go sue i just wanted to say that uh, jody i knew from we've had her on programs before with three square and nancy we love the gwyn center so i mean it's just yeah. it's so wonderful to have the two of you on we've known you from other your your previous <laughs> or i think jody's still with three square but um Yes, but it, just it, it was it was a, yeah, it was a very very easy decision to make, and That's you know, right. 
Jerry and I had said from the beginning, we were going to be very ambitious with our um, endorsements because as, as you said, Nancy, um, city council uh, portions of the ballot are right, usually right around the, uh, the school board and all that. We want to make sure everybody goes all the way down that, uh, that ballot. Um, but one thing that you two should know, and, and so should our assembly women that are, uh, that are on here, that um, with, our, with a, a Nevada Now endorsement, you do have the opportunity to get you know, extra people helping you canvas or postcards or you know, phone banking. So always let us know um, what your schedule is and, and we'll get volunteers out um, in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, and whatever, we can whatever. also, I was just going to say, we also can share that on social media. We social can open our yeah. Facebook page so that our members know and, and, you know, that they can help out. So let us know any events you have or any ways that we can help. Yeah. yeah. I always let me, let us know when we have, you have canvassing things. Cause we will, we will get, we will get it out there. Um, so yeah. And that goes for all of, all of our candidates on here. Um, one last question to, the two of you, and we'll we'll go back to Nancy for this one. Um, if elected, we, yeah, we did fill out hundreds of you. Yes, um, we did, Venetia. We love that hand cramps and everything. Um, if elected, what are your? Uh, we know your background and who you are, but what are your three top priorities if if elected to office? Thank you for that. Housing is the first and foremost. That's actually what prompted me to run. The second is balanced growth with a very intentional look at water and water usage and water requirements. And then the third is uh, personal slash public security. We're hearing that a lot of folks are worried about the rising crime, but that also includes the violence in the schools. Hi, and I think in terms of top three priorities for Henderson City Council race is first and foremost, just like Nancy said, is housing in our community. Um, but my prior, my plan is called the SMART plan for Henderson, but my priorities about how we actually implement that SMART plan um, around housing is um, also thinking about East Henderson. So in Henderson, we're weird. Like you have to run citywide for a council seat. And so we don't have ward only voting when it comes to city council, you run across the whole city. But I say to everybody whose door that I knock, um, I'm really running to be the advocate and champion for East Henderson, because that's where um, our housing shortage is really critical. And also where we need transit improvements on Boulder Highway. Boulder Highway is the most dangerous road in all of Nevada. And the, the neighborhoods that align Boulder Highway have said to the city over and over that they want to see transit improvements on that road because as people are darting across to get the bus, they actually are, um, are dying. Um, and then the other um, piece of that too um, around Boulder Highway uh, is that we also need more primary care health facilities along Boulder Highway. We have two hospitals whose emergency rooms are still um, overfilled with people using emergency care as their primary provider. And so I'm committed to bringing um, a federally qualified health center to Boulder Highway to make sure that um, people can uh, get their primary health care services. And also, I would love to partner with one who also specializes in mental health care because that can be part of your federally qualified health center. And Sue, if I could just add one more priority um, that I think actually is a compelling reason uh, for both Jody's candidacy and mine is one of the issues I'm running on too is education. And I know people think, well, what does a city council person have to do with education? But it goes back to my point that I think our community has lost confidence in CCSD. And as a result, you do see the local jurisdictions playing in the education space. So North Las Vegas during the pandemic and even now is leading the way in micro schools. The city of Las Vegas has a charter school and Henderson is very much engaged in the conversations to either have their own school district or break up the district. So I think now more than ever, we need folks like Jody and myself who understand educational policy and the implications, the equity implications for any you know, program or intervention that the city start to look at um, you know, as we move forward. So I'll just leave you with that. 
let me let me ask you because I think Nancy, you mentioned that were several people that were running against you, and and you're the only woman. Um, it, 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 this race or that those offices of city council are they partisan or nonpartisan? They are nonpartisan, and just um, so it's nonpartisan. Our party ID will not be on the ballot, but there are just for people's awareness. There are of the seven, there are five Republicans and the other, and I'm a Democrat, and the other Democrat is a 21 year old gentleman. Um, so I'm running as the most experienced Democrat in the race. And Jody, do you know who your competition? Oh, yeah. So there are six of us in my race as well. Um, and I will say, in terms of like, the nonpartisanship, like it is a nonpartisan race, but because we are for the first time aligned with the general cycle, which is not the odd year elections, it used to be for local elections, but the general cycle, people are much more in tune to who are you affiliated with. And it's the very first question I often get asked at the door is, are you a Democrat or a Republican? And so we really are targeting in on our Democrats and really will be part of the effort from the top of the ballot to the bottom of the ballot to get Democrats out to vote um, this uh, election season, for sure. I mean, midterms are really hard in general for Democrats, but it's so vital that we get our Democrats out to vote. Gary, do you have anything? Well, I was just going to point out that that now is is uh, we're nonpartisan, but the fact remains we've yet to find a Republican who supports our core issues, and that is is we go through our our PAC endorsements. I mean, that is there is no wiggle room on our six issues, our core issues, and you know to be endorsed, you have to be, as both of you are, you know, in, you know, it's supporting our issues. So. Um, we, we appreciate you and, and people should know that, that you're, that you're really good on those issues. So just to be clear. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Jody and Nancy for being here. I'm glad I could give you such great news. It was kind of, I was holding it in my back pocket for, uh, for today. Um, I do want to give, cause we've got a couple of minutes. I do want to give our three uh, assembly members that are running for reelection um, a couple, a couple of minutes if, uh, uh, share something if, if they have anything going on right now. So I'm going to start with uh, Assemblywoman Claire Thomas. Thank you, Sue. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm um, one of those victims of allergies also. So um, I, I put in the chat, but I just wanted to express that this was one of the best Zoom calls that Nevada now has put on. I am totally blown away because our young people, you know, as they say, the state of the union, the state of Nevada youth, I believe that we are on the right track. I am so impressed with them. And, um, you know, my heart um, is, is racing a little bit, but, Back to me, I don't have a primary. <laughs> so um, I am uh, uh, running for re-election. Uh, and uh, this is in Assembly District 17 in beautiful North Las Vegas. And I will definitely, definitely call on you for those uh, <laughs> postcards because uh, Marla was one of my, her and her mom were one of my postcards writers. And I am so thrilled to know that I have the support and I really do appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. We love you, Claire. Yeah, you, you, you know we love you. We, love, we, we missed you yesterday We're doing selfies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and now I will, and, and uh, I, you've got Petra here on the call that, uh, that's, that's right in your uh, North Las Vegas there, Claire. So excellent. Now I will move to uh, Assemblywoman Chandra Summers Armstrong. Hello, everybody. Chandra Summers Armstrong, Assembly District 6. Man, <laughs> I have to echo what Claire said. These conversations are amazing. And this is why we do this, why I wake up from my after church nap, because this is the important 
Um, these are the Im important discussions that we have to have uh, in our communities. Um, I'm so very proud to be here. So very proud to be endorsed. Proud of the gutsiness of the women in this cycle who are running. Um, to hear Jody and Nancy speak on issues that are not, um, you know, in the atmosphere and 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 filled with fear and hatred, but talking about issues that deal every day with the the problems of regular people. This is what we need: leadership that is engaged with and in contact with the people to help deal with the issues that our communities are asking us to do. And I, I am hopeful that I too am part of that conversation. I'm trying my very best. And um, I'm just glad to be here. I'm grateful for you all. These conversations are amazing. I will say that Nakia um, went to school briefly. My son graduated. I have three sons that went to ATEC. And I'm telling you, Tears, I, tears. I, it's just amazing. I'm so proud. She's uh, in my district. And um, this is the beautiful strength that we have in our communities. And we've got to support these young ladies. So thank you all um, for the endorsement. Um, congratulations, Nancy and Jody. Um, I will be uh, filling out postcards or walking or something uh, for both of those ladies because I believe in what they're doing. And um, thank you all for your support. I really, really appreciate it. Love it, love it. Absolutely, absolutely love it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, you can't help but get teary-eyed and, and uh, uh, excited and, and, and fired up. Yeah, I mean, I'm exhausted right now, but I could probably go walk a couple of miles for, uh, for all of these people on here. And then last but not least, where's, where'd you go, Venetia? I know you're here somewhere. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Um, I'm so incredibly honored to be in this virtual room with all of you uh, and also to be serving with Assemblywoman um, Summers Armstrong and Thomas. Uh, they are the real deal. They are amazing. And I learned so much from them and just love hanging out with them. Um, it's so great to have a female majority legislature, um, which is fantastic. And I also want to, uh, Nancy is amazing. Um, I, uh, we've worked with her a lot at Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada. So I can honestly underline amazing multiple times. And Jody is as well. And uh, Jody, I love you for mentioning all the work that needs to be done on Boulder Highway. My um, district is on the east side and Boulder Highway from Samstown to Galleria runs right through the center of it. Um, and it is definitely in need of attention. Um, I don't have a primary last cycle. My first cycle, I had three other uh, folks in a primary and now I have none. I take that as a good sign, but I do have general. I'm actually filling out thank you cards as this meeting is going on. Um, but I wanna thank now for everything that you've done for decades in Nevada. Um, and for your endorsement, it means the world to me. So thank you. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening and I can't wait to see all of you in, in the future in person with walk cards on the ground. And just as an aside, Venetia is a former Nevada Now president. So she's been with Nevada Now a very long time as well. And Naida, she's, a, she's an attorney. Yes. Yes. Naika, Naika Venetia, Venetia, Naika, yeah. <laughs> Now you've met. Just, just making the connections. <laughs> um, I have, I have nothing more. I, I, you know, we have these meetings and we bring young people on, um, and I get so inspired not just by Layla and Naika, but by Amy Marie and I, I, yeah. I, what more can I say? Well, and of course, things we, we like, you know, we were just over at a fundraiser. We've been, we went to the powwow yesterday. We've been trying to get around. And so um, we'll be starting, you know, hopefully someday we'll have our meetings in person, but it actually is pretty nice to have it on Zoom because, you know, people can, you know, run back from a, a, a meeting and, and meet with us and um, we'll continue to do these for a while. 
um, we're going to come up with some ideas for fundraisers so we could make sure to give our endorsed candidates, you know, money and, and time. And uh, if you, you know, we're, Laura was just saying, let's have a postcard writing party. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, wait, we're, we're fired. We're fired up. Yeah. And, so um, and we'll definitely share your, your events and um, contact us and, and let us know how we can get our members involved. Uh, you, you know, I always say people want to do the right thing and they want to get involved. If we could just, you know, we tell them what they need to do. So, and we got, please. we got, we got to get the, we got to get the turnout too, but yeah. Yes, definitely. Yes. So and, it, and if it yeah if it means anything to anybody uh, yesterday at the powwow like I said we had a, we had an absolute blast there but we did meet meet some incredible young women that hopefully we'll be able to, to share in, in future meetings so um, yeah two days of being fired up and inspired I'm I'm ready to go well and Mercedes Krause had the students that she was giving awards to at the powwow so it was wonderful to see these young people doing things for Earth Day so. Um, it's, we have a lot of really great young people in our state and we need to highlight those. And, and if you do know some young people doing um, activism in any way in our state, we, we want to continue to highlight um, what young people are doing and um, work with Naika and Layla and help with anything they're, they're doing and highlight their work too. So, and thanks Amy for joining us as well. We love what you're doing and need to work in, you know, with the Cupcake Girls Coalition and continue our work we're doing together in coalition so thanks for joining us um tonight we, we before, will, uh, before we go can i have yes, just a second of course so we have all these great plans to do all of this volunteer work and i'm the head of the i'm the chair for the volunteers and i need some support so what i'd like to ask if any of you would like to support me I'm going to put my phone number in the uh, in the chat, and if you give me a call and tell me that you like to make some phone calls, that would be awesome because we need to call our membership and tell them what we're doing because some of them don't come to these meetings, and you know how email is it's, it's hit and miss. So we we feel like we want to reach out directly to the. Um, to the uh, members and have individual conversations with them. So if you would like to help with rallying the troops, uh, I would love to have you on, our, on, our, on, my, on my committee. Okay. So here it goes. Great. And, okay. and same, same goes for any, anything you want to do for volunteering. Um, we, you know, want to get everybody involved. If you, if you want to canvas, write postcards, make phone calls, um, texting. I know some people are doing texting. Uh, let us know and, you know, we'll start gathering up our volunteer lists and let you know when things are, are uh, happening and that you can help with. So, Audrey? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, for those of you who don't know, I'm the president of the Nevada Federation of Democratic Women. And for those of you charming women, most of whom I know, who do not have a primary, please send us uh, any kind of collateral that you would like for us to put on our website and we will be happy uh, to support you in that way. Um, we can't, you know, we're, we're not doing endorsements like NOW is doing. We're doing it a little differently based on our national uh, bylaws. Uh, so we can't support anyone who's in a primary. So that's an issue. And I did put in the chat, um, we're having an event May 22nd um, you can go to nvfdw.org, and I did put it in the chat um, slash events, and you'll be able to see exactly what we're doing. We will have candidate tables, but the conversation is going to be about issues, and I would love nothing more than to have all three of you young women at our event in person talking to people. Thanks, Great. Karen. <laughs> and, and Audrey and I are working together on the ERA with the Federation. So um, we work in coalition with the Federation on that as well. And yes, we uh, again, I'll be letting everybody know what we're going to be doing on the state ERA ballot question. It's going to be something that Nevada now is going to be one of the lead people on. And um, we're going to need your help getting out the, it's already going to be on the ballot. It doesn't have to get on the ballot, um, but we're going to need help getting the word out. So just, you'll be hearing a lot about that. 